So we have Josh uh, Dalkey in the studio here, kind of. Josh, you know, I was reading online, I think, um, you had posted something about your family land in Minnesota. And it's been in the family for how many years? Oh, man, I don't know the exact count. I should probably come up with that one of these days, but somewhere around probably 130 years. That's insane. Yeah. Wow. So it, would, would that be like your, what, great, great grandparents or... Right. Yeah. They, uh, they came over here from Sweden and, um, they left a, a rock infested country that was difficult to grow stuff. And they came to a rock infested country that was maybe even colder and difficult to grow stuff. That is amazing. I'm, I'm living in a 130 year old farmhouse, by the way, in rock country. So I consider sure. my, I consider myself a rock farmer, but I know that you had a, um, you had a pretty, uh, memorable hunt there last fall. Um, take, take us into that one first. Yeah, so um, even though I've been deer hunting for a long time, uh, I'm sure a lot of your listeners can identify that, uh, you know, there haven't been more than a couple opportunities in my life where I've actually been able to hunt a deer that I had some kind of history with. Um, that just hasn't been my reality. And uh, that that's even with running some heavy trail cameras and stuff like that. Uh, most of the deer I've hunted or ended up shooting. Um, you know, it was, it was more based on like a general pattern and uh, a buck, you know, that I, that I want to shoot walks in at some point and I shoot it. But uh, this was a different scenario for me in that I did actually have some trail camera images of this deer from the previous year at a few different locations. Um, from what I could tell, it, it seemed like he was only uh, calling our farm his core for a certain part of the year. Um, which I did later come to find out was true, and I, I'll get to that in a minute. But um, I had images of this deer. He was a great deer. We never saw him in person at all, never even got a look at him in 2022. And uh, started running uh, cameras again, summer of 2023. He rolled in. I think first image I got of him was... Uh, and maybe in October, I think it was when I was on an antelope hunt during October, uh, I was driving out to Wyoming and I got a picture of him and I was like, wow, he's actually back. He survived, which is a, a tall order in a lot of parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, whether it be hunting or car collisions, a lot of deer uh, get hit on the road by our farm. And then the winter that we had in 2022 was one of the worst on record. We lost a lot. Of deer um to put it in perspective i i did a late season muzzleloader hunt in december late december of 2022 and we counted i think it was 23 yearlings on one of our fields um and only two does which i don't i still don't understand how that worked but um we were going out there trying to do some doe patrol with me and uh three of my buddies and we saw what we, what we could identify at least as 23 yearlings that were out there. So we didn't end up even shooting a deer that night. Wow. Well, between us and our neighbors, we found somewhere between 20 to 25 wow. yearlings that died that we found in the spring of 2023. Um, so we lost a lot of deer. So it was pretty miraculous to see that that buck made it through, showed back up, and uh, he was super regular. So... Um, I kind of had him pinned on what his, his core was. And I mean, like within a 200 yard radius of where he was wow. spending most of his time. And, uh, that was just all through, through running cell cams. And thankfully I had deployed the, the one key camera we put on a community scrape during Turkey season in the spring of 2023. And, uh, luckily, uh, I put lithium ion batteries in it and it, it ran, all the way up, up until it didn't um, didn't die until I think like sometime in late October, early November. Um, so I was able to go in and hunt them for the first time, and then and then switch the batteries. But uh, moral of the story was we put that camera out on that community scrape during turkey season, and that was right in the bullseye of his core. So the fact that we didn't have to go back in there at all and we could just let him do his thing and then go in strategically was, was a huge part of it. Um, so he was showing up on some other cameras and I, I take a, a pretty conservative approach 
um, like I said, this is the first, really the first deer I've been able to hunt where I had history with. I mean, I've hunted somewhere. I've maybe been at a, a friend's or an outfitter's or something where they knew the deer. But on a personal level, this was my first time to, to go after a deer that, that was on one of our properties. And so regardless of whether it's that or just deer hunting in general, I'm pretty conservative. And I usually kind of start from the outside and work my way in. And so that's what I was doing with this buck. Because he was showing up once in a while on some other cameras, but it, it was usually it was usually at night. And uh, I figured, well, maybe with, you know, the rut kicking in and things changing a little bit, maybe I'll catch him daylighting. I didn't. I, I hunted the fringe and I waited for the right wind to get in there and try to hunt him um, where I knew he was because he was hitting that community scrape uh, a dangerous amount for for his survival. And uh, we had also set a stand on that community scrape during that spring turkey season as well. So I went in there to hunt him for the first time in late October, kind of pre-rut. And uh, sure enough, I saw him coming in, uh, coming back in the morning. Um, and I just caught one little glimpse of him and he didn't come in and hit that scrape. He was hitting that scrape every single day wow. at that point. <clears throat> whether it was morning or evening um he was daylighting a bunch and hitting that scrape and that morning even though i had the wind right he didn't come into that damn scrape <laughs> so um i watched him go into this thicket only about 100 150 yards from me and i was pretty sure that he was bedding in there and uh it was one of those spots where i'm i'm in some pretty core bedding and so i got in there real early in the middle of the day and uh I was on edge the whole time and you know you don't know which way to look because there's deer coming from everywhere it's one of those i kind of had to roll the dice knowing that i'd probably have some deer downwind of me which did end up happening um so i thought i had some deer blow at me pretty early in the day i thought maybe they probably blew it for me literally and uh i happened to be looking forward toward the scrape and set it behind me and i heard a little bit of commotion behind me and i looked back there and sure enough, he had circled downwind and busted me, and I caught another glimpse of him. He was running back into his bedding. This was and, the same uh, day, the the, the first the, time you saw him. The same day. Okay. Same day. Yeah, I was out there for I think I sat for like six or seven hours, and uh, no, wait, I, I sat longer than that because it was an all day sit. I got in there in the dark. I caught him coming back in the morning. And then uh, I had a bunch of deer moving around throughout the morning and middle of the day. I had some deer downwind that blew at me and they were, we were all within 100, 150 yards of each other. So he definitely heard those deer blow. My theory <clears throat> is that he had heard those deer blow earlier in the day and instead of coming in to hit that scrape, like he had been doing every other day, he scent checked it instead because he heard them. He's probably laying there and he's like, all right, well, I'm going to get up go hit that scrape like I do every day, but I am not going to go march right into it. I think that, I mean, who knows what he was thinking, but um, sure enough, he busted me. And of course I was distraught and I thought I'll never see him again and this and that. And uh, I was so nerve wracked sitting on that scrape because I was in bow range of it. Uh, Minnesota last year, you were, you were able to start using crossbows and I'm, I love hunting with crossbows. Um, so I was using a crossbow that was, a, that was an ideal spot for a crossbow because maybe you could get away with drawing, but I was only 20 yards from this community scrape and there was deer everywhere. So not having to have that extra movement would be a huge benefit. Um, so I decided after that whole rigmarole with that, um, shotgun season was going to open in about a week, 10 days. And I got no, I'm not a dedicated bow hunter by any means. Um, I just love to deer hunt. I'll use, I'll use a compound. I'll use a crossbow. I'll use a muzzleloader, a slug gun, a rifle. But I really like gunpowder. So, I decided um, I was going to just do all day sits when gun season opened, and just try to maximize my opportunity to have an encounter with them. And uh, I was going to hunt the downwind side of that community scrape with my shotgun. So that I was still in range of it, but the only way that he'd be able to get downwind of me, if he was going to come scent check it again, he'd basically have to go walk onto the road because this is right along a road. So I figured if I could get far enough over and high enough 
and do a hanging hunt that I'd be able to uh, probably get a shot if he came and hit that scrape again at some point. Well, the wind conditions switched so that it wasn't going to allow me to do that setup that I had, I had envisioned. And so I was actually camping out there and I sat in bed the night before shotgun opener, just looking at hunt stand and looking at all the wind conditions. And I knew that I, I couldn't, it's one of those things where you want to convince yourself, oh, I can get away with it, but I knew better. So I wasn't going to push it, but in order to, to pivot and have a different setup, I knew I was going to have to do a, a hang and hunt somewhere else. And, uh, I wasn't really looking forward to doing that. So, um, and actually I'm going to backtrack a second. I told you I was originally going to hang and hunt that spot by the road. I was actually going to hunt from the ground uh, cause I thought I had enough elevation to be able to see that scrape and be less impact, not having to go in there and hang a stand. And so I was just going to stand by a tree all day. And, uh, when I woke up that morning, I was like, I have to do a hanging hunt and I knew where I needed to do it. Um, where the wind was a little bit better a spot. I could slip in from the road on this kind of open pond area that wasn't in sight of the scrape, but there was a peninsula that led to the scrape that I knew he would just, he had just been in that general area. So I got up that morning. Um, I had some, some Hawk, uh, climbing sticks that weren't even assembled yet. They're still in the box. So I woke up extra early. I put the damn sticks together. <laughs> I hauled everything out there. I hiked in from the road. I hung this stand on this pond. Uh, there was deer sign everywhere in there. Uh, the wind was perfect for me and uh, ended up seeing a bunch of deer that morning, a bunch of bucks that any other year I normally would have shot. And uh, sure enough, right when I was kind of just letting my guard down a little bit later in the morning, the neighbors were blasting off. I'm, all I'm thinking is someone shot him. I was getting ready to text one of the neighbors to see if, if maybe he had shot him, but, uh, I was keeping this tight to my vest. So I, nobody, I didn't think anybody else, uh, I shouldn't say I didn't think anybody knew about this deer, but I, I wasn't communicating with anybody about it. Let's put it that way. Um, so all of a sudden I looked up and he was standing there. I had about 60, 65 yards. And, uh, it was one of those, it was one of those encounters where, I took a second to just admire the deer because it was just such an uh, amazing animal that like I looked up and I was in disbelief that he was standing there and I just took a second to admire him. And then he started walking and he was going to go into this thicket and I kind of had to snap myself out of it. I was like, <laughs> what the hell are you doing? Stop looking and shoot. <laughs> so, uh, and I was trying to self film. So I raised up on him and I'm like, no, get the camera on him. I go to move my camera and it's on a ball head. Yep. And it was tightened. I thought it was tightened to just the right tension where I'd be able to adjust the camera with one hand and it would stay. Well, I went and I adjusted it and it had, it had loosened just enough that when I let go, the camera just went and tipped over and the lens hit the camera. Arm. Oh my made gosh. And I'm like, forget the footage and I, just, <laughs> I pulled up and shot him. It was with a, uh, a 20 gauge slug gun with a, uh, Oh, it was probably like, a um, some kind of federal copper bullet, I believe it was. And, uh, yeah, he only went 20 yards and. Oh my it. gosh. Now how old was you? You said you saw this deer like in 22 for the first time you knew he was there. So what was he then like three year old or was he older than that? Yeah, I think, well, I think in 22, he was, a he was, he was a four or a wow. five-year-old in 2022. And then I shot him in 23. So he was either five or six. Dang. And, uh, the reason I can confidently say that this is, this is the crazier twist of the whole story. So small town, um, my great uncle, he's in his, he's in his, uh, he's like 86 years old. He lives up there. And uh, I went and got him and we did the whole recovery together. My brother and his girlfriend showed up and we made a whole deal of it just to spend some time together and enjoy the deer. And we decided we were going to go into town to the gas station to weigh him because they had a weigh station there. Mm -hmm. So we roll into town. We weighed the deer. He wasn't actually that heavy body weight wise. I thought he'd be bigger, but I think he lost a bunch of weight. Um, 
in the couple weeks leading up to shotgun season. And uh, so I don't even, I don't remember what his, uh, his dressed weight was. It was, it was nothing super impressive, but the, the kid at the check station was like, Oh, do you want to enter into our big buck contest? I'm like, I guess, what does it entail? And you know, it's, it's all based on body weights. So they right. have different classification or uh, different like tiers, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> He's like, yeah, well, I'll just take a picture and we'll take the weight and you'll, you'll go on the board and here's the categories. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to win, but whatever. Sure. So puts my picture on the board. Um, I end up going back up there for muzzle loader season. And uh, at that point, there's probably 50, 60 pictures on this board, a bunch of nice deer. Um, it's kind of cool checking it out. Well, then I get to... Um, I believe I was in Oklahoma in late December and I get this Facebook message through Facebook messenger from this guy. And he says, word on the street is you got a nice buck by, I'm not going to say where it is, but mm -hmm. so-and-so city. And I'm just like, you gotta be kidding me. Like I keep a pretty low profile in that area. Um, I mean, I'm friendly with people and stuff, but you know, I just kind of do my thing. And uh, my, my response to him was, it depends who's asking. <laughs> and he's like, well, I'm pretty sure we have uh, the property that is uh, kitty corner from you guys to the, to the Southeast. And I know exactly what property it is because there's a corn food plot on there every year sponsored by the NWTF that they leave up all year and all of our deer from our woods are patterned on that food plot. They go there every single night. So it's just a matter of whether I can catch them during daylight, which is not, not often, but every night they cut through our woods and then they cross the road and they go into that food plot. And so we end up talking, um, end up kind of hitting it off, just messaging each other. And we agree to kind of trade some information, trade some photos and stuff. And, uh, I'm like, how did you find me? He's like, well, I was in at the gas station and I was looking at the photo board and I saw the buck and I recognized it. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> I'm like, okay, that's crazy enough in itself. Well, how did you find me? Well, he just did some digging around and we happened to have a friend of a friend and connected on Facebook somehow. And he found me and he put two and two together. And uh, the kicker of the whole story is... He's, he tells me that he's got this history with this deer. He's been going after him. And so I, I felt a little bit bad because he had, he had been after this deer for like, I think three years. Oh, wow. That he, he had made a, like he had identified him and he was letting him go. And, but the, here's the, the thing. The deer was only living over on his property after season and then into early summer. And then he would come over to ours for the rest of the year. And he would never daylight on that guy's property. He'd go into that corn food plot every night and then he'd come back to ours in the dark. Wow. We're talking literally distance from his core bedding to that food plot is probably only about six, 700 yards maybe. So this deer was living most of his life, I think within, let's just say a thousand yard radius. Yep. He had everything he needed. And I'm pretty sure that's what he was doing. He might've ventured out at, at some point, maybe he did, but between our information that we put together, I think he was really keeping it tight. Um, so the, the coolest part about this story to me is the guy said, I've got his match sheds from the past two years. And he said, I want you to have the sheds. They belong with the deer. Wow. And I was like, <clears throat> I sat there for a few minutes and then I responded to him and I said, dude, this isn't my deer. I just happened to be the one who was lucky enough to shoot it, put some more thought into this. I do not have any expectation that you would give me those sheds. Those are your sheds. You had a history with this deer even more than I did. Um, and you know, don't, don't feel compelled to give me those sheds. He's like, I just want to, he's like, I'm assuming you're getting it mounted. So I just want to see it when it's mounted. So swing by my house sometime when you're on your way up to the farm. I want to see the deer and I'll give you the sheds because they belong with him. 
My gosh, what a story. That is amazing. Um, Pretty cool. Number one that you, I mean, you did have a good history with him and you did, um, you outsmarted him. Um, but for that guy to do that, it's pretty cool. Now I have to ask, um, are, are you originally from Minnesota? I am. Yeah. I'm, I grew up in South St. Paul and okay. that, that farm is in central Minnesota. Okay. So what I want to tell you guys something about Josh that I've learned, not just about Josh, about wh- where he's from Minnesota. Some, some of the best hunters I've ever met have been, and I don't know why this is Northern Minnesota, Maine, Vermont, Michigan. Um, if you listen to that story, which took 20 minutes, so many things that Josh talks about, and I know Josh is much younger than I am, are things that guys like Greg Miller did back in the 70s and the 80s, John Eberhardt. The tactics that he used, granted, he has modern technology on his side now, and I'm not going to get into that because I think it is... It's a tool. You used um, you used remote cameras. Back in the day, you kind of were guessing. That's kind of how I learned. You, you kind of guessed, but we could not pinpoint it like you did. But over the years of all that experience, exactly what you talked about, um, especially on smaller properties of these mostly what we say Midwest, but it's mostly upper Midwest, northern places, even in some places of Illinois and Iowa. But those bucks learn as they get older how they can survive. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen a situation like that where you have this buck that's four or five years old or sometimes even six, which is almost unbelievable when you when you bring in the hunting pressure and the like, Minnesota, he's talking about the winters. That winter was like one of the ages, killed a lot of deer. Yes. But how they can hone that in, and he's talking about a core area, which is different than the home range, obviously, of a, a, what, 700 acres, or not even, 700 yards. You're talking maybe a couple hundred acres of his core yes. range. Absolutely. Yep. And you figure that out, but, you know, what, maybe one other guy knew about that deer? Maybe, maybe he told his buddies, but not too many. It wasn't like a a suburban deer where it's like, yeah, everybody knows that deer by Fleet Farm because he can't get hunted. But you you have a deer like this. I just find it fascinating. Deer Talk Now is brought to you by Wildlife Research Center and the new Golden Rope Scent Rope Kit. The kit comes with four ounces of Golden Rope Scent Concentrate, three cable ties, and three scent ropes made of proprietary fibers meant to absorb the maximum amount of scent. Simply saturate the rope in your scent of choice, hang it from a branch, and watch the trail cam photos come flying in. For more information, go to wildlife.com. Um, one question I do want to ask you, and this has nothing to do with product, I'm just curious. What kind of uh, cameras do you run normally? So I run... Uh... I run stealth cams and muddy muddies. Um, they both run through the same app, the command pro app, which is convenient. So I don't have to use multiple apps. Um, but, uh, yeah, it depends on, uh, depends on what I'm trying to do, but usually I'll run them just in photo mode with like a, a three second delay, a two photo burst, um, just to try to get the information I need without digging too deep into the battery life um that's for deer but for turkeys turkeys i do a bunch of different things which we can get to in a little that's bit what here. i want i do want to pick your brain on that because i know you've got some tactics for that but and you said you're using those lithium batteries also yes lithium ion um and man i know they're expensive but it's so worth it and uh, i'll tell you i've had very good there's thing about lithium ion batteries is there's only like two or three brands you can get you got energizers and then there's like there's like two brands on amazon and one of them i think they're called like bevagor or something they're they're a gray body with red writing on them um per battery they're the they're the least expensive lithium ions you can get if you and you should order them in bulk they sell them in like 72 packs or 100 plus packs um it's it's a lot to stomach when you make that purchase because they're very expensive but 
you absolutely make up for it in the back end. Well, you said you went from, what, turkey season all the way to October. Oh, yeah. On one set of yeah. batteries. Yeah, and that was with a lot of traffic. I mean, there were deer on that camera every single day, multiple times a day. Um, and I was running it daylight and dark, 24 hours a day. So you can get a lot. But also, um, man, I've been I've been testing the solar this spring and uh, been having really good luck with that too. Yeah. The solar panels actually can do. They're they're pretty pretty magical. I'm impressed. I'm I'm running that those on the cuttybacks, and I have had that camera out all winter. And and granted, we haven't had a terrible winter, but it it's it's t- sending me pictures every day. That is really cool. Um, let us let's switch quickly over to turkeys, Josh. I would love to talk to you all day, and we're going to probably have to get Josh back for another one of these, Ian. But um, right now, you're getting. I know you're eating. The, the other thing I want to say, Josh is you and I have known each other through the industry, but the more I talk to you today, I learned like Jake was right. Like you're a hell of a lot like me because like I would have done the same thing. I'm like, I don't care if I kill this deer with a bow or a crossbow or a shotgun. And I am going to, the other thing, um, Dave Larson would have done what you said you were going to do. Go stand by a tree. Most people would say, Oh, you can't do that. Like, yeah, you can, you have to have, be that eternal optimist. But, um, absolutely, man. Um, switching to turkeys and i know i use the hunt stand uh app a lot i know you use it for turkey season but give us some uh, insight as to people say well what do you need to scout for turkeys for like how hard is it well if you, tur- <laughs> if you turkey hunt long enough you're going to figure this out well dan uh you're gonna have to you're opening up pandora's box i'm obsessed with turkey hunting i have been since i started when i was about 15 or 16 years old and uh i got it bad so (laughs) you're gonna have to probably cut me off and limit me at times or otherwise we could be here for a week you got about 10 minutes so (laughs) oh boy well 10 minutes okay well go find one and shoot it i guess i don't know no that you know we we know you got better tips than that um how how do you scout because i know you're a lot like me well when i used to be as eaten up with it as you probably still are um, you have to have several aces up your sleeve. You have to, you just simply have to, you have to have those bonus spots. You can't just have your one access spot and say, oh, that's where I'm going to turkey hunt for four weeks or whatever, how, however long you can get hunt in your state. What, um, how do you approach it? I'm really happy you just said that because that is the most important thing for consistently killing turkeys. All right. If you got one tag and you're only going to go hunt once a year or whatever, that's a whole different thing. But if you're trying to consistently kill them through the entire season, um, which I, I hunt all over the country, but in the Midwest here, the season for me is generally um, early to mid-April till June 1st. And I hunt all the way to the bitter end. I always hunt the last day of May by myself until the season closes on that day, um, even if it's thunderstorming, even if that just means sitting in my truck um, grinding it out, watching turkeys. I will be there until the, the last minute of the season. But what you just said is the most important thing for consistently killing turkeys, and that's having A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. You can't have an a, just an A spot. You can't just have an, a B spot and a C spot. You, the more you can have, the better, because as the season goes on, the patterns are going to shift, and they're, the dynamics are constantly shifting. And so you're going to have birds moving around and you're going to have birds coming into different areas that they weren't before. And you're going to have birds just coming and going. And so you might get excited, you know, two weeks leading up to when your season opens. Um, and then, you know, you got pictures or you got, you're, you're out there scouting and you see birds and then all of a sudden you go out there and they're not there on the, the one weekend you might have to hunt or whatever it is. Well, you need somewhere else to go. And then if that doesn't pan out, you need somewhere else to go after that. And, you know, maybe they're going to be there in the morning and not in the evening. So maybe you need two different spots for just for hunting one day. Giving yourself those options is the most important. So for me, um, and there's still a part of me that's that's really hesitant to shed a lot of light on this, but I am a big door knocker. Um, don't get me wrong. I'll hunt public land, but if I don't have to, I won't right. because I like to hunt unpressured turkeys. And I'm not afraid to knock on anybody's door. And I, I still haven't had a gun pulled on me. Um, 
I know. I I did have a, a guy with a shotgun behind his door one time in Montana when I was antelope hunting, but he didn't grab it. So that was nice. But <laughs> I did see that it was there. Wow. Um, but I have really good luck door knocking, and uh, I can actually pull up hunt stand right now and just just give you a quick like snapshot of just one area that I hunt. I won't say where it is, but um, this will give you an idea just by taking a, a glance at this um, of the permission properties that me and my crew of guys um, work with throughout the season, just in one area. Um, oh my gosh, look at that. So, so all those pins are places where you can go. Most of them are places we can go. Some of them are, I mark all the spots that are no's as well. I have, I have everything color coded. Oh, I have okay. a system to it so that when we're driving around, we can just bounce from one property to another. Um, and the big thing with me is Wisconsin, for instance, you know, you know how the system works there. A lot of your listeners probably know how the system works there. It's all based on a quota system. It's still a draw, but then there's always surplus tags left over sure. for certain zones and um, you can buy surplus tags when they're available. You can buy one per day until they're sold out. So theoretically, you could go into the last day of the turkey season with 20 tags in your pocket. Yep. Um, I buy one tag for myself for each season for D, E, and F, because as a non-resident, where I hunt earliest, I can't get A, B, or C. Right. I can only get D, E, and F. So I buy one tag for each of those seasons. So I always have a tag in my pocket for each season. But then the rest of the time, I spend 80% of my turkey season scouting and for other people and bringing other people. That's um, pretty cool. Friends who don't have as much time as I do, that you know, I'm, I'm still single. I don't have kids. <laughs> so. That's what people, the, their first question is, goes like, what does this guy do? And he gets, all, he gets off for the whole turkey season. <laughs> well, I don't, I still have to work, but um, mornings and evenings, I'm going to be out there. Um, you're like Brian Love it because you're going nonstop. Brian, Brian is uh yeah, Brian is the it, same way. You got to be insane to do it because I can't even say I've tried to keep up with him. But it's like that is how just if you haven't done it, and I, I hesitate saying it because I don't want <laughs> to give away my spots. But um, let me just back up when you were talking about okay. I don't have the charisma that you do to knock on doors and get permission as much. Mine was always public land. But what I always did was I'd have my one or two spots that were on private. And then those public lands, um, one was always good at like nine o'clock. Everybody was out of there. They were up there for the roost. They were listening to turkeys gobble. The turkeys all went and went from nine to noon. You could kill a turkey. And you Absolutely. basically just had to... Uh, adopt that mentality some when we finally this was quite a few years ago when we finally could start hunting in the afternoons some people wouldn't even touch them and then you're like there's that one spot that those uh, one thing that josh said those turkeys come and go especially as the season goes on and then some of them are like when you're talking about e and f those uh last two weeks you wouldn't see a turkey out there for the first four weeks and then those last two weeks w was lit up but one thing that you mentioned on um, that app is what I really like about that and not to be that guy, but I use it to find out if I know there's a really prime piece of private ground next to public ground, I guarantee you I'm using hunt stand to find out where that property line is because if you set up and you sit there long enough, you're going to have people say, well, I don't own land. You don't have to own land. You just have to know how to, you ha have to know how to walk. And you have to know how to be patient, which I have no patience. But like once you get back in there and you know there's turkeys in there, if you want to fill a tag, you, you can do that. And um, that is what's different today than what used to be. What used to be people just did not know how to hunt. I think a lot of people know how to hunt now and people know how to call. They're listening to guys on YouTube and, and Instagram and TikTok and all these videos. It's like we're teaching people how to hunt. It's just... Um, learning the next part of it, I think is the big, the big hurdle for most, for most guys. Just to add on to that, um, 
I have to be able to brag about this because it's the only time I'm ever able to do it. I killed five out of six periods two years ago. I, I got um, first, That's awful, man. first, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And then everybody was accusing me. as like, yeah, where's your bait pile? I'm like, nope, can't do that. It just you just got to be crazy enough to want to go out there and, and kill them. But uh, it was throughout the it was throughout the middle of the day, some in the morning. Um, it's kind of that same hot, hopscotch mentality. Um, but That's I don't so quite cool. have it as you do as as far as that network. I mean, if you have a network like that, that extends your extends your spring for turkey hunting. But my gosh, you really must also be learning how to how to deer hunt those same places if you have access to them. Oh man, yeah, the amount of uh... The amount of sc- deer scouting you can do while you're out there turkey hunting um but it's funny because you you have to you got to flip your switch you know like if you're out there turkey hunting you're not you're not necessarily uh opening yourself up to the observations that you need to get deer intel you really gotta tap into your consciousness and force yourself to take a deeper look because you know the way that you walk through the woods for different different reasons and different intentions your, your focus shifts dramatically. Shed, shed hunting is a great example. I'm the worst shed hunter on earth. But uh, if you're not looking for sheds, yeah, you'll, you'll stumble into them now and then. But like, imagine how many you walk by when you're not looking at the ground. I mean, when I'm turkey hunting, I look at the ground, look for scratchings and tracks and stuff. But most of the time, I'm trying to look way ahead, um, you know, see if I can catch any movement or just I'm always thinking about my next move. So, um, but then, you know. And trying to learn the terrain too on, on some of those properties where there could be a natural barrier that you didn't know about, like a, a fence line or a creek or, you know, something like that. You got a turkey gobbling and I know how what you mean. You're like trying to project like, okay, that turkey's over there. What's standing between me and him right now? And, yes. how, and how do, it's almost like, you're playing army when you're a kid like how do i get to him yeah. w- without him knowing i'm I'm over here yeah that's the biggest thing man is is, is getting to him and any little bit of terrain or cover that you can use to your advantage you're right like and that shifts throughout the year as well you know when the season opens in mid-april when i can start hunting in minnesota there's like zero leaf cover and then by the time you get to mid-may it's a jungle so you, you kind of learn those little nuances too. You know what you can get away with at different times of the year. Um, and once you sort of figure out kind of what their overall patterns are, because their patterns are crazy repeatable, like year to year. Yep. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they pass that down through just learning and also through a deeper level in genetics. Uh, I think a lot of that behavior is just is passed on. So it's no coincidence that you see them in the same spots. Uh, a lot of it's probably food source driven too. you know, they're shifting their patterns with available food sources and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, just being able to hunt all season on a lot of these places and understand those seasonal shifts is really important. You got to pay attention to those details. And that, that comes back to the consistency, killing them consistently as well. Like, um, yeah, if you got a bunch of properties and you, you go out and hunt them for one season, you probably do all right. But to be able to repeat that year after year, you're constantly just taking in that knowledge. And so you get more granular and you get more focused on on your strategy because all those little nuances of uh, shifting foliage, shifting food sources and uh, shifting how the flock dynamics work and stuff. And when gobblers start to venture out, you kind of figure out like, okay, this spot is useless, even though it looks like an A spot. I know that it doesn't get good till the third week of May. And then you go back there year after year and it's like, oh, there's a strutter third week of May. Like it can be shockingly like clockwork. Um, and if you, if you pay attention to that stuff and the thing about it is, man, it's hard to keep all that straight in your head and file that away. So once again, this as a tool using hunt stand, you know, I mark all my observations with date and time and what's going on with the turkey is it a single strutter is it a group of jakes is it a strutter with hens like because all those little flock dynamics make a difference too because you know you know like for instance if you if you go to a spot and see you see there are a bunch of hens at some point you know whether there's a gobbler there at that time or not there is going to be 
period. Like probably in short order. If you see hens, there's going to be a gobbler there probably even that day. Or if not, it's going to be the next day. But those hens are not going to be by themselves when they're still breeding. Not for uh, long anyways. No. Th- that's a good point there as far as, okay, some somebody might be listening to this and say, oh, yeah, it must be nice to have 20, 20 different spots to hunt. Or, you know, I don't have time to knock on that many doors. Well, here's the thing. If you pick up on what Josh just said, let's say you you have, you're, you're going to be, you're only hunting your one spot, your 40 acres, your 20 acres, whatever. If you take that intel that Josh is talking about and say, maybe for whatever reason, the third week of the season is when you see those toms normally. If you take, if you take, um, if you take inventory of that data, you know what I'm saying? Then you start planning. It's like, you know what? I'm not going to apply for first period, you know, or I'm not going to put all my energy or my vacation days into hunting the first period. So that's one thing. The other thing, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, no, the, 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 knowing the terrain is the biggest thing and knowing where those hens are and then just adapting that um, – that patient's mentality. Is it going to pay out every time? No, but it's really going to help you out. So on that, I actually have to cut you off. But um, Josh, I know you do a lot of different things. You do work with Hunt Stand. You do work with GSM. Um, tell the listeners, you know, some of the things that you have been working on and some of the things um, maybe product-wise that you find pretty exciting for this year. Oh, man. Yeah, there are, there are several things. Um, Hunt Stand is going through a, a big revamp right now that people can look forward to coming out this summer. So you'll have enough time to get used to it before fall deer seasons. Um, and we're not going to drop it right during the middle of turkey season either. So um, it's going to be a whole overhaul like of the user interface. Um, we're going to also be adding some new tools to that that I can't really talk about right now. But uh, people can look forward to a, a refreshed hunt stand, which is going to be really nice. I'm, I'm, I'm testing the beta version right now, so I've already got some experience with that. And then, uh, man, some of the other stuff I've been working on, um, we, we own, uh, GSM owns walkers. So we've got some pretty exciting new products for walkers. Uh, the Recon Muff, which is kind of an upgraded version of the Razor electronic muff that so many people have. I think just about everybody I know has a Razor. Um, the recon is kind of the next generation of that, a little bit higher quality, but still not that expensive. And then the most profound product that we've got coming out under the GSM brands is with Stealth Cam, and that is our revolver cellular trail camera. Um, it's a 360 degree cellular trail camera. It has six PIR detection zones surrounding the camera with a rotating lens. So when one zone is triggered, the lens shifts over, snaps that image, and then you can program it so it'll snap all the other PIR zones 360 wow. immediately. So you're not just getting that one snapshot of what's going on of a deer walking in front of the camera. Um, you're finding out what else is going on around that's there. That's pretty cool. Right. So you could have the doe here and you could have the buck behind you. So that, that, exactly. that's, that's pretty cool. So or how about how many times do you put a, a trail camera on a tree where you think it's the right trail and that buck is walking behind that camera all year? Always. And <laughs> that always yeah. happens. And yeah. I, th- I think they learn it. I think they, they actually learn it if they know those cameras are there. Well, you guys, yeah. I know that's just a brief snapshot. Check that stuff out. Um, Josh, thank you so much for joining us. We're, like I said, we're going to have to do this again because we could talk for hours on this, not just about scouting but deer and turkeys. Um and yeah, good, good luck. And I, I plan on seeing lots of dead turkey pictures on your Facebook page. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Okay, Josh Dalkey. Uh, for Josh Dalkey, I'm Dan Schmidt. Thank you for joining us for Deer Talk Now. This um, We are how many away, in one away from our 100th episode? Or we're, we're probably already past it. We're, we're past it. We're past it. We're going to put that in the comments for you because we have a pretty good um, uh, user-generated question one on that. But f- for Josh, I'm Dan. We'll check catch you again next Thursday for another episode and just check out these podcasts wherever you can find a podcast or watch the video versions on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, etc. We'll catch you next week for another episode of Deer Talk Now.